Hebrews chapter 6 in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 6. We are beginning a new series today. And I'll be speaking mostly to saved people. Those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. People who are washed in the blood. People who claim to be children of God. If you're here today and you're saved, say amen. Amen. It is a great thing to be saved. It is a wonderful thing to be saved. But what we will see today is that the benefits of being saved aren't only relegated to the future that awaits for us when we get to heaven. There are a lot of blessings and benefits to being saved right here, right now, in our present day and time. And I've entitled today's message, More, Better, Greater. If you found Hebrews chapter 6 in your Bibles, if you would stand, please, I would be honored of the reading of God's Word. We'll begin reading in verse 9, and we'll read down through verse 17. But when we get to verse 17, I'd like us to read that word, that verse together out loud. Starting in verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which he has shown toward his name, and that he had ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them that run, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by none, no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he, he had patiently endured, he had received the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them the end of all strife. In verse 17, if you'll read it with me, Where is God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. Lord, as we look to your word today, help us to realize and help us to remember that your word is holy. Yeah. It's preserved. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Lord, please do not allow these words that we read today to be empty or powerless. Help us to understand and realize that these words, that your words are, are powerful. Yeah. They're real and irrelevant to us today. Father, don't allow us to simply hold your word in our hands, but help us to apply your word to our hearts. Yeah. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today who has not accepted you as their personal Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Yeah. Yeah. I pray that for those that are saved, Father, I pray that Today would not be routine, yeah. but our time together today will be sanctified. Lord, we ask you to speak to us in a very powerful way. Yeah. Help us to develop a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation of our salvation. Yeah. As always, Lord, nobody here needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Yes. Yeah. I ask you to speak to us and help us to be ready and prepared to listen to your voice today. Lord, it's a blessing to be in your house with your people. Yeah. Father, we thank yeah. you for our brothers and sisters that are here today. Yes. Lord, we don't meet here today to hear from each other. We're not here just to catch up with our friends. We're not here to spend time with our families. Lord, we're here to meet with you. Yeah. Lord, you tell us that when two or more are gathered <coughs> together in your name, that you're there in the midst. Father, we know that you're here with us today. The Holy Spirit, we ask you to not just be among us. Don't just be present, but be the center of all that we do. Right. Give me the lips to speak your word. Give us minds to understand your word. And give us hearts to be changed by your word today. Yes. We pray yes. all these things in the perfect, precious, heart name of Jesus. Amen. Right. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. When we got to verse 17, the reason I asked you to read this verse out loud with me was because there's two words that I want us to focus on 
And to find in verse 17, we find these words, more abundant. We're going to talk about a thought today that some Christians are a little bit hesitant to discuss. And I don't think it's always on purpose that we avoid discussing these things. But there are some very good, solid, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches that often do not preach this thought very much, or at least if they do, they don't preach it in its entirety or in totality. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture, every single verse is inspired by God. Amen. Every single verse in this book that we hold in our hands is God-breathed, and it's profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. And doctrine simply means teaching. All Scripture needs to be taught. We can't just avoid the passages that we don't like to think about. Yep. We can't avoid the, the passages that we don't they don't sit well with us. It's profitable for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. And we understand that. If you're here today, you would not be here on a Sunday morning when the weather is beautiful outside if you thought that God's word had no power, that there was no benefit of being in God's word. But it is necessary to correct us and to walk right. and help us walk in our right. Christian life. But in verse 17, a, a second on. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it goes on and says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That word perfect doesn't mean perfect in the sense that we use it today. It refers to being complete, to be whole, and not be lacking in any part. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That word thoroughly means great, absolutely, totally, completely. That's God's intention for us, to be thoroughly furnished, not just barely getting by in Christian life. And you might be thinking, if, well, if we read these verses, and some of you might even have that memorized, if we know that all Scripture is inspired by God, and if we can't thoroughly be furnished in our Christian walk without it, then why do we sometimes avoid discussing some Scriptures? And the reason is, there's a lot of, we talked about this in the Sunday School message this morning, there's a lot of people, there are some groups of people who claim to be Christians in some religions that take God's Word out of context. There's some very well-known uh, speakers very well-known authors who have manipulated and distorted and misrepresented what God's Word actually says about some topics. And as a result, a lot of preachers, a lot of churches, a lot of Christians avoid discussing certain things for fear that we'll be lumped in with those people that are misapplying God's Word. In case you're wondering what I'm talking about, I'm referring specifically to the prosperity gospel. And I don't want to devote our entire time today to dispelling what prosperity preachers teach and proclaim, but it's important to understand that what they believe so that we know why there is some avoidance to it, even among some Bible uh, believing and Bible preaching churches. But there, there are many different areas on which the, the prosperity gospel and prosperity preaching is biblically wrong. But for time's sake, what it really comes down to is that this man, David W. Jones, wrote an article in 2015 that was entitled Five Errors of the Prosperity Gospel. And he wrote, simply put, the prosperity gospel teaches that God wants believers to be physically healthy, material, materially wealthy, and personally happy. But the truth of the matter is, there's times in your Christian life where you're not going to be physically healthy. Right. There's times in your Christian life where you're not going to be materially wealthy, right. and you're not necessarily always going to be happy during your Christian life. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's maybe falling into sin. The reason is, we live in a fallen world. Yes. It, so we, what, we see one reason why this, this team is sometimes avoided is we look at, at least in totality, is because we don't want to be lumped in with that type of teaching. Another reason why is because we have an enemy. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says that we have an adversary. The word adversary, that's, I'm sorry, the, the name Satan actually means adversary. And his name indicates his nature. He's the enemy of God. He's the enemy of all that God does, and he's the enemy of all that God does loves. Let me, let me remind you today that, that God loves you. More than you could ever imagine. And since God loves you, make no mistake about it, Satan is against you. In the New right. Testament, he's called the devil. The devil means a false accuser or a slanderer. Other titles include the tempter, the wicked one, and the accuser of the brethren. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he tells us that he's a murderer and that he's a father of all lives. That's right. Amen. And one of the lies that the devil has spread is that this Christian life 
is it supposed to be enjoyable? Hmm. One of the lies he spread is that if you've been saved, don't expect to have any fun. John 10.10 10 tells us that the devil is a thief. And that his goal, his intention is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's been pretty successful at it. Right. Mm -hmm. He's convinced countless people not to get saved. That if they do get saved, they'll never have fun again. And those that have gotten saved, he's not able to steal their salvation, but he's been able to steal their joy. And destroy their ability to be an effective witness for the Lord. I'm thankful, I'm very thankful for pastors and preachers that expose prosperity gospel for what it is, which is a false gospel. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm, I'm afraid that all we do is point out what God's word doesn't promise us, and we miss out instead of what it does promise us. Uh, Amen. Amen. We can feel so strongly in our convictions that there is a better life coming to us in eternity when our earthly lives end. In Romans 8, chapter 8, uh, verse 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yeah. Praise God for that. Yep. Praise yeah. the Lord that if you're saved, this world is as bad as it's ever going to get. That's right. Yes. Yeah. We have a home eternal in the heavens. Yes. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Praise God that heaven is our destination. Yes. Amen. So let me remind you, Jesus may have gone to prepare a place for you, but that doesn't mean that in the meantime, you have to toil through life unhappy and miserable. That's a lie from the devil. It's time for us to hold fast to God's word and resist those lies from the devil to live the life that God actually has planned for us. And again, I hope you're excited about heaven. I, I have family in heaven that I can't wait to see. My best friend died when I was 21. I can't wait to see him again. I, Jess and I have a son or a daughter that we lost that we never got to meet. I can't wait for heaven. But there's an old saying that says, we can be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Hmm. Right. If all we do is sit around and lament and wait for heaven, we miss out on all the joys and promises that God has for us right now in this world. And although he doesn't promise that we'll be rich or, or healthy, and that our lives will be carefree and without worry, while we're here on earth, there are some things that he does promise. And we're going to look at them a little bit more today. With a focus on more, better, and greater, we're going to focus on what God tells us in his word he will give us more of. Amen. And one of those things that he does tell us that we will give, he will give us is more abundant life. If you look at verse 9 there in our text, Hebrews chapter 6, it says, But beloved, we are persuaded of better things of you and things that accompany salvation. You look at that verse again, it says, we are persuaded better things of you. Things that accompany salvation. Now we know what that word persuaded means. It means convinced. It means that we're assured. It means that we are certain of something. And what is he certain of? Certain of better things for you. Let me ask you today, are you convinced? Are you persuaded that God has better things in mind? Maybe you never thought about it. But this verse says, to those who are saved, there are better things that accompany your salvation. Let me ask you another question. What accompanied your salvation? I'm not talking just about baptism. If you've been saved and baptized, that's great. I'm happy for you, but there's more to the Christian life than just getting saved and baptized. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says that he came to, he came to seek and save that which was lost. And I praise God that he sought you and that he saved you. But he didn't just come to save you, to give you just any old, average, insignificant life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I want to say this as sensitively as I can. But there are a lot of Christians that have life. They've been saved by God. But they're missing out on the abundant life that Jesus said he came to give them. God gave his only son. I want you, those of you here today that are parents, to think about this. Now, God forbid this were ever to happen. But think about if you had to make the decision to give the life of one of your children in order to save someone else's life. 
if it cost you your child's life to save someone else, would you want that person to just live an average and significant life? A life lacking any real passion or desire? Or would you want them to live a full, <laughs> abundant life? Now, all of us sitting here that are parents would say, I couldn't bear the thought of giving my, my child's life in order to save someone else's. But if I did, if I did do that, I would want that person to experience a very full, complete life. Why? Because of sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to give up someone that we love so much, only to see that sacrifice in some ways go unappreciated. I'm grateful and not used would be devastating. It would be heartbreaking. And that would be for our own children. God gave his only perfect, sinless, blameless son to die for your sins and for my sins. Yes. And he didn't give his son so that we would have any limited life. He didn't send his son to give us a temporary life but so that we can have an enduring, an everlasting, an um, eternal life. God didn't come to give you an inadequate or incomplete life. He came to give you more than that. He came that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. Now, how much more does God want you to have in your walk? We're going to look here at verse 17. It says, where it says, we're in God willing more abundantly to show us the heirs of the promise. God is willing to show you and to give you a more abundant life. Heaven is going to be amazing. Now, there's no question about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. Heaven's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. But just because we have that reward to look forward to doesn't mean we should miss out on the reward that God has for us right now. In Genesis chapter 15, God spoke to Abraham and said, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. He didn't say somewhere down the line, later in the future, I'll be your reward. He said, I am thy exceeding great reward right now. And in verse 9, we see that God has better things for you. God has more for us. And where it gets confused sometimes is in Luke 16 11, the Bible speaks about true riches. And some people think that those true riches that God talks about are the monetary things here in the world. That if somehow if I'm not wealthy, if I'm not healthy, that somehow I'm not living the Christian life. And the problem is that some, some people, even Christians, have gotten confused about what true right. riches really are. Right. The true blessings, that, 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 uh, the true promises that accompany salvation. But it's not money. It's not, it, it's not those temporal things. Right. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 5, it says that money that, we, that so many people think is the key to happiness... The money that you think indicates God's blessing, it says, it says riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward the heaven. So our focus in our Christian life shouldn't be on the temporal or material things that the world places so much value on. Our focus should be on the true riches that God promises us. And without question, one of those blessings is a more abundant life. Not only in heaven, but here on earth as well. There's more life, there's a more abundant life that God has for us. Verse 9, we see that, that, that God has better things for us than just having life. God wants us to have a more abundant life. If you'll turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1 really quickly, we'll see the thought that God wants better things for us and that He wants more, that he, there's more that He has planned for us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 4, Peter writes, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, who is that us that he, that he mentioned? Who's he talking about? It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, is Peter talking about just a few disciples, just a, a select few Christians? Now, we find the answer back in verse 1, where it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Peter writes about it and says, every single person, every individual, every man, every woman, every boy or girl that have obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're saved, you've obtained salvation. Not through your own righteousness, but through God's righteousness. And in, through precious faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. 
But what does it mean here when Peter says, precious faith the righteousness of God? Well, faith is very simply to, to trust in God, to believe in his ability to sustain us, to secure us, and to save us. If we, if we trust and we really believe that God really loves us and actually willingly laid down his life for us, then why do we sometimes have difficulty believing that God actually has exceeding great precious promises for us here on earth? I personally believe that this is the reason why we see fewer and fewer, fewer, and fewer people saved today than in the past. It's not because God doesn't want safety. That's right. 2 Peter 3 9, God says that God is not willing to any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has not lost his desire to save souls. That's right. He hasn't lost the power to save people. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. So why aren't more people saved? Because we as Christians have our salvation isn't that big with you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do you want to know why more people aren't getting saved? If why more people aren't glorifying God? It's because we're not letting our light shine. Our neighbors, our family, our co workers, they don't see enough light in our own lives to make them realize that they're missing out on it. And if you don't agree with that, either you're wrong or God's wrong. Jesus said, if you're shining enough, people will recognize it. Right. And that will direct them to God. The problem is, a lot of Christians aren't that shiny. Yeah. A lot of Christians right. are walking around with that same downtrodden, defeated, and depressed attitude as the same people that have no hope. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says that we are the light of the world. Yeah. But the problem is, a lot of Christians have lost their light, lost their shine. And as a result, the lost people around us, the people that God wants us to love and influence for him, are thinking to themselves, why would I ever want to follow him? He's going to start the place as I am. Why would I want what she has? Her life's as dull as mine. In 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, he repeats, says, ye are children of light. Amen. Now, if it were to be dark in here, if we just turned out all the lights, came in here at nighttime, blocked all the windows, just had complete darkness, We'd have trouble finding our way around. We'd have difficulty navigating. Some, some of us would be so frozen by fear that we, we'd be, we wouldn't even attempt to move. We'd be afraid we're going to fall or trip or get hurt. You'd think, yeah, I can't see where I'm going. I, I'm, I'm just not going to take that step. But if one person, one single person in here had a flashlight, they could leave every single person in this building safe. I have no doubt that if we were to lose power someday and be in total darkness, if we had just one person here that had a source of light, we'd all make it out okay. But in the world that we're living in, filled with pain and disappointment and confusion and injustice, with so many people living in spiritual darkness, and why are they scared? Why are they stuck? Why are they stranded? Because too many Christians aren't shining their lights. We're not showing the power of God and the love of Christ the way that we should be. You know, I'd be thinking, well, I do shine my light. I'm here in church today. I've sang the song. I'm, I'm even listening and following along with these verses in, in the Bible. I'm glad you're in church today. I'm, I'm, I really am. But while we're in church today, how many of us have friends or family members that have no idea what impact God has made on our own lives? People in our lives who might know that we say we're saved, but don't really see any difference in our lives than the other people in the workplace in this room. And again, I'm glad you're in church. I'm glad you're in this church. Amen. I can honestly say I, that I love this church. I love the people here. I love seeing what God is doing. I love being a part of God's work here. But if we only talk about the goodness of God, we only talk about his power and his blessings when we're here around other church folk, we're not letting our light shine. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. It's easy to let our light shine when we're in church. But it needs to be shining just as much, even more so, when we're around lost people. Uh, so they see the light in us, and they're drawn to God as a result. If our light always shines when we're in church, or when things are going our way, or when we're with our, our saved friends and family members, that's not really carrying the torch and shining the light the way that God tells us to. There's more than just having a light here on it. The, 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 
in church. Now that's, that, that, we like kind of having a light here on church that's on a timer on Sundays and Wednesdays and just kind of shuts off when we're not here. So what should people recognize in our lives? People should recognize that we have a more abundant life. When we say that's what it's characterized by, one of the characteristics of a more abundant life is more joy. Once again, back in Hebrews chapter 6, in verse 9, Paul says that there are better things that accompany salvation. And without question, joy is a gift from the Lord that accompanies salvation. Right. Acts chapter 13 says that the disciples were filled with, uh, with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Now, let me remind you today that if you're saved, the Holy Ghost lives inside you. Yes, that's right. He indwells you. Right. And when we have the Holy Ghost presence in our lives, that should be accompanied by joy. You know, you're thinking, well, I just don't feel that joy. That things haven't been going that well for me. And the thing is, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is temporary. It's based on our current circumstances. But joy is not based on our circumstances. For the child of God, we can still have joy even when we don't have happiness. In John chapter 15, 11, Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Regardless of what you're going through today, God tells us that his intention is that, your, is that his joy remains in you. No matter what you face, that our joy would not be lacking or insufficient, but that our joy would be full. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and belief that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. God gives us more joy that accompanies the more abundant, the more abundant life that he has for us. We can look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, where it says that we are giving exceeding great and precious promises. And in 1 Peter 4, 13, it says that one of those exceeding promises is that he may be glad also with exceeding joy. There is more to our Christian lives than just going through the motions. Uh, going to church, reading our Bibles, praying, all out of a sense of duty or necessity. God has promised better things. Right. And one of those things is more joy. We live in a fallen world. We, yes. we all face difficulties. Yes. We face difficulties at home, yes. at work, we have physical yes. challenges, spiritual challenges, financial difficulties. Life is rarely easy. We don't always have happiness, but we can always have more joy. Amen. I know that when we face different trials and challenges, we all deal with those things differently. I know that in my own life, for me personally, when I'm going through a period of time where I feel despondent, discouraged, or even to, even depressed, I have a tendency to, to pull away, try to just deal with things on my own. And part of the reason why sometimes as Christians, we don't have as much joy as God tells us that he, has, that he wants us to experience. Romans 14, 7 says that none of us live unto himself, and no man dies. God doesn't intend for your spiritual life to be lived in isolation. He has more than that plan for you. And you won't find it trying to live for God on your own. No matter how long you've been coming here. Maybe you've been coming here for years. Or maybe you just started attending here. Whatever the case is, you don't have to live the Christian life alone. You don't have to do this on your own. And if you do, if you try to do that, you'll miss out on more friends and the love that God has for you. You'll miss out on others that want to see you grow and grow with you. You'll miss out on experiencing being part of something bigger than yourself. And you miss out on having more joy than God tells us he wants us to have. In Psalm 116, it says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. And say, people, we don't just have to tolerate life. We don't have to just settle for some mediocre spiritual life with little happiness or little excitement. God has joy for you, and not just a little bit of joy, but fullness of joy. How many you think about today? Just ask yourself, how full of joy are you today? If your joy isn't where it should be, if your joy isn't full, God tells us a way that we can get more of it. Get into God's presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy. As Christians, God tells us that he has better things for us. There are more promises that accompany our salvation and that one of those promises is more joy. And we get it when we come into his presence. 
I've had this conversation with quite a few people about joy. And there are Christians that will say some, some version of the story, you know, I feel happy, I feel excited, I feel more joy when I'm at church, but once I leave and I get home or I go to work, I just don't feel as joyful. And there, there's a reason for that. When you come into his presence, you experience that joy. But if you want to have more joy, joy that lasts longer than just the church services on Sunday and Wednesday, joy that sustains you throughout the week, that when you're dealing with relationship problems, and dealing with challenges of raising children, dealing with job decisions, dealing with financial stress, then you have to come into God's presence consistently outside the walls of this church, too. I would invite you to do this, and for some it might require a little bit of a, a change in your thinking. But church should not be a completely new and different experience when you come in here on Sunday morning. It should be a continuation of what you're already doing in your individual and personal lives. Right. If you only pray when you're in church, if you only think about God's word when you're in church, if you only sing when you're in church, if you only really focus on God when you're in church, you're not going to have the fullness of joy right. that he wants you to have. Right. God wants you to have more joy. In Psalms chapter 43, verse 4, it says, then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, Paul writes, I am filled with comfort, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. No matter what you're facing today, you can have more joy. You can have more joy when you spend time in God's presence. Jude 1 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Psalm 21, verse 6, Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. There's more to this Christian life. There's a more abundant life. There's more joy. And finally today we see there is, thank God, there is more grace. Amen. In James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace. No matter what you're going through today, be reminded that God's grace is sufficient. You might be struggling, but he giveth more grace. You might be hurting, but he giveth more grace. You might be disappointed in some area of your life and you can't seem to get right, but praise God, he giveth more grace. Back in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, once again, it says, we are persuaded of better things for you. And one of the better things about this Christian life is that God promised to give us more grace to face anything that we encounter. 1 Timothy 1.14 says, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. 2 Corinthians 9.14, the exceeding grace of God we see that God has promised to give his children more grace. Now, we understand that grace is necessary for salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, By grace are ye saved through faith. But God gives us more grace. There's more than just saving grace. Grace not just for salvation, but grace to sustain us and empower us to live for him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for me. Right. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We don't have to live this Christian life in our own strength and our own power. God gives us the grace to do it. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it tells us to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We don't have to face our difficulties on our own. We don't have to face trials and challenges by ourselves. God gives more grace to strengthen us in all things. In verse 20, chapter 15, verse 10, it says, Paul writes this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, for the grace of God, which was in me. By the grace of God, I am what I am. God. Today you are who you are only by the grace of God. And you might be thinking, well, I'm still not where I should be. I still mess up. I still struggle. I still have these areas of my Christian walk that I have difficulty with. I'm not where I should be, but praise God, you're not where you used to be. Amen. You might not be where you, you want to be. None of us are. None of us have arrived spiritually on our path. Right. But thank God, you're on the right path. Paul writes at the end of verse says, but the grace of God was with you. You might face trials and challenges, but the grace of God is with you. And I know that there are people here today that are hurting in very real ways. There are people who are struggling physically. There are people struggling financially. People struggling in their relationships. And what happens sometimes is, is the devil's really good about 
getting into our mind and making us think we got forgotten about us. That his strength and his power has left us. He hasn't forgotten about us. He hasn't forgotten you. He gives more grace, more joy, and a more abundant life. As Christians, we're never going to be perfect. Our lives are never going to be perfect. But sometimes we need to be reminded that God promises more than some of us are experiencing in our Christian lives. There are better things. There is more that accompanies salvation. More abundant life, more joy, and more grace. If I could have Ms. Jennifer and Brother Bud come forward, we could bring out for time of invitation. If we could have every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do that.